As we think uh, about the book of Revelation, there's a, a lot of complicated things in it for many people. We're not going to be looking at those parts. I'm going to um, be going through a series on the letters to the churches in Revelation. Those letters uh, are not as complicated as the rest of Revelation, not as highly symbolic. They're, they're epistles to uh, the church. But when we think about the book of, of Revelation, uh, a lot of people just think of it as a book that speaks about the future and, and nothing else. But as we read Revelation chapter 1, the book of Revelation is about the present rule of Christ as the King of Kings of the world. Jesus is, is reigning presently and his kingdom is now. It's not just something that is far off into the future. In fact, Revelation presents us with a great serpent, a woman who brings forth a male child who is to rule the world, and the final restoration of the tree of life. And so when you think about it, Revelation ties up the great drama of redemption that began in Genesis 1 to 3. Even tonight, you're not going to get out of the relevance of Genesis sermon. It's here in Revelation. See, Revelation is tying up what went wrong in the beginning. But it's not just about the future. It's about the past, but also about the present, because it's meant to be read and heard. You read those, we read those words in verse 3 in chapter 1, that when the book of Revelation went to those seven churches, the messenger would, would pass it on to those in charge of the church, and those in charge of the church would stand in front of the congregation, and they would read the entirety of the book of Revelation. We're not going to do that tonight. We're just going to look at the book of Ephesus. So when we think about the book of Revelation, especially these letters to the churches, they are very much relevant for us today. But the book of Revelation is written to those seven churches in Asia Minor. Asia Minor, for those who don't know, is modern-day Turkey. And those seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sidus, Sardis, sorry, Philadelphia and Laodicea are real churches that received a real message because many people throughout history have tried to view those churches as different eras in church uh, history. That's known as sort of the historic approach to the book of Revelation. So Ephesus would be the, represent the sort of first period in church history, but I don't think that's quite right because these are, are real churches in real places which had real messages delivered to them. In fact, if you look at the order of the churches, they're, they're actually a postal route, and you can work it out as you go from Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamum, and then you go down through the rest of the churches. So it made sense for them to be written in that order because that was the, the order in which the letters would be delivered to those churches. In fact, Notice in each letter you will read, the Spirit says to the churches. And so as those messages go out, it's not just going to one church in Ephesus, one church in Smyrna, one church in Philadelphia. There's probably a head church in Ephesus that will hand that letter on to other churches in those areas. And they are to listen to the word of God. But verse 9 in chapter 1 tells us something important that John is exiled on the island of Patmos. He's been exiled there because of the Roman government, and they placed him on the island of Patmos because he was faithful to preaching God's words. He's a prisoner because he's been preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's been telling the Roman Empire there's a different king. Caesar is not king, but Jesus is king. And now... He's in prison on the island of Patmos. But the good news for John is that even though he's in prison, he's not alone. Because in chapter 1, verse 11, we read that on the Lord's day, he was worshipping and the Spirit of God came upon him. And Jesus Christ revealed himself to him. And he told John to write the things that he saw in a book. And that's the message that we're going to read tonight what we read in the book of Revelation. Jesus made himself known to John on the Lord's Day. So even though this, these, this letter that we're reading tonight is delivered to the church in Ephesus, uh, 
It's addressed specifically to them, but it addresses us also. We are also to apply what is written in God's word to our own lives. And so we're going to think about some of those things this evening. So verse 1, Jesus says to the church in Ephesus, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, when we think about Ephesus, if you don't know anything about Ephesus, Ephesus was one of the leading cities in the ancient world. It had um, the center of worship there was the, the temple of Diana or the temple of Artemis, um, which is bigger than sort of Wembley Stadium, one and a half times the start of Wembley Stadium. It was the place where people would gather to indulge in idolatry, sexual immorality, commerce, banking, that sort of thing. And so this city was known for its promiscuity. It was known for its idolatry. In fact, when you read um, Acts chapter 19, you see the apostles take the gospel to Ephesus. And what happens when they take the gospel to Ephesus? The people in Ephesus, essentially the townspeople who make the idols, recognize there's a problem. If this message spreads, then it's going to cause us problems of income because we're no longer going to be able to sell idols because idols represent false gods and these people are presenting to us a different God, one God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's an outcry in Ephesus. The gospel was destroying the idolatry in those cities. And that's what we do as we take the gospel. The gospel will go out there and it will confront the world and it's idolatry. And there will be pushback. As John faced pushback. But who is the angel? Who is the angel? Now people disagree. Some people think it's the pastor in the church. So the message was de delivered to the pastor of the church. That's because the Greek word uh, for angel, angelos, can mean both angel and it can mean both messenger. John the Baptist was an angelos. He was a messenger. But if you read throughout the rest of Revelation, um, the word angel appears a lot. And all other times, it literally means an angel, a spiritual being. And this is probably what it is here. It's most likely a guardian angel of that church. We tend not to think of that these days because we dampen things down. But that's in the word of God. It's in the word of God. Angels had authority. And... The word goes out to the churches. In fact, here in, in uh, Revelation 1.20, it actually interprets the symbolism for us because we, we read um, of Jesus holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. But Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20 interprets that symbolism for us, this is one of the helpful places in the book of Revelation because in many other places, sometimes that symbolism isn't interpreted for us. And we know from Revelation 1.20, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are, of course, the seven churches. And Jesus tells us that he holds those stars in his right hand and he walks among the churches. He walks among the lampstands to examine the churches to purify the churches because he's going forth among them to examine them to hold them accountable and what does Jesus see as he walks through the church this is a question for us is the Lord pleased with what he sees is Jesus pleased with what he sees not just in the church in Ephesus not just in the church in Philadelphia but at the church in Pack Street, at the church down the road, the church in Counterstorp. We can't fool Jesus. Jesus examines churches today. This is not just written in the past of those seven churches. Jesus very much walks among his churches today, and he wants a pure church. But let's look at verse 2, because in verse 2, Jesus begins to rebuke the churches. But notice when Jesus begins to rebuke the church in Ephesus, 
He begins with compliments, not with criticism. He begins with compliments, not criticism. And when you think about the seven churches, I want you to think about one thing. One of the criticisms Jesus never brings against any of the seven churches are its size. Jesus never looks at the church and says, you're too small. There are too few of you people in this church. That's what I hold against you. That's never a criticism of the Lord Jesus Christ of his church. Because as you go around churches today, you increasingly see small churches. But that's not a criticism of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he tells them, Jesus tells the church in Ephesus what is right before he tells them what is wrong. He says more positive things about Ephesus, whom he rebukes, than he says about Smyrna and Philadelphia, whom he does not rebuke. But the Lord commends three aspects of the church. The first aspect, if you look at verse 2, is their sacrificial deeds. In other words, he talks about the fact that they have work, they toil, and they're patient in their endurance. The church in Ephesus were spiritually active. They were known for their works, and the Lord deemed them commendable. He thought that was a good thing, that they worked, they toiled, and they had patiently endured. Because no church succeeds on spare time, on nominal commitment. You cannot grow a church by nominalism, by being inactive, by not taking part. Churches that succeed and grow are churches that are active. And Jesus commends the church in Ephesus for the fact that they work and they toil. These are healthy churches because they're a working church. They're involved in preaching the gospel. They're involved in things like hospitality. They're involved actively in the church. And these people were committed to the gospel. And Jesus commends them for this. Notice the second thing the Lord commends. The Lord commends their sound doctrine. The church at Ephesus was known for its sound doctrine. And the Lord commends that. And we would obviously think that's a good thing. And it is a good thing. Jesus commended them for that. Now, here's the thing. When you think about the church at Ephesus, you might think, well, it's obvious that they're a church known for their sound doctrine because who planted the church in Ephesus? Well, it was probably planted by um, Priscilla and Aquila. Um, Apollos was probably involved in it at some point. If you read Acts chapter 18, Paul stayed there for three years. He ministered among that church, preaching faithfully the word of God to them. And then who did Paul write to as a pastor in Ephesus? He wrote two letters to Timothy to teach that church in Ephesus. So no wonder they were sound in doctrine. They had the best of teachers. They had the best of teachers, and they were committed to sound doctrine. But because of their sound doctrine, they had an intolerance for those who were evil. Those who were evil. They could not tolerate evil in their church. And when you think about churches today, church discipline is the missing mark in the contemporary church. You can almost do anything in any church today but church discipline. People don't care how professing Christians live as long as they attend, as long as they serve, and as long as they give. But that was not true at the church in Ephesus. In fact, people till today will say, well, the Bible says judge not lest you be judged. You shouldn't be judging people. But if you read on in Matthew chapter 7, what does Jesus tell people to do? He tells them to beware of what? False prophets. If you're going to beware of false prophets, what's the one thing you have to do? You have to judge. You have to make a judgment, a sound judgment. Jesus is condemning false hypocritical judgment. But we are to judge. We are to hold people accountable. We are to hold to sound doctrine. Because that keeps the church alive. And Jesus commends the church 
at Ephesus for their sound doctrine. In fact, notice the church at Ephesus had high standards because the Ephesians hated the works of the Nicolaitans. Now, we don't know too much about that group. Not much is said in commentators because we just don't have much information about them. But if you notice, they're mentioned in the church in Pergamum and associated with Balaam. And Balaam is associated with sexual immorality. And there are some things there you can uh, take from. But the church in Ephesus could not stand the teaching or the works of the Nicolaitans. It's not to say they hated the Nicolaitan people, but they hated their works. They tested them. They tested the Nicolaitans. In fact, remember what Paul said to the Ephesian church in Acts chapter 20 and verses 28 to 30. This is as Paul is about to leave. He's, he's ministered in that church for three years. He said this, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among yourselves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Paul told them what would happen. He had ministered there three years, and at the end of those three years, he said to them, look, you are to pay careful attention, because when I go, people will come, not from the outside in, but they'll rise up from among you, and they'll try to separate the flock. And that's why Paul warned them that they must pay attention. And Jesus commended the church at Ephesus for this because they could not tolerate false teaching. And so when a so-called apostle turned up on a Sunday at Ephesus, they tested him. They didn't just invite him to become a deacon in the church and to serve and be active, which is, let's face it, if a new person walks in among most churches today because many of them are small and they say they're a Christian, sit down in a pew, welcome two weeks later, They may be up preaching. See, the church at Ephesus tested people. They didn't just take them on their word. They tested those who called themselves apostles. And if they didn't line up with the apostles' doctrine, they rejected them. And Jesus commends that. The Ephesians looked at content over style. The contemporary church looks at style over content. They get it the wrong way round. We are called to test all things. And Ephesus was a church was commended by the Lord Jesus for that. What's the third thing? Well, the Lord commends their endurance. The Christians in Ephesus were maligned and persecuted, but they endured patiently. You know, when John is writing to these letters... They would have some understanding because even John, some people would argue that his letters were written from Ephesus. And so they would have known John was going through these things. John endured patiently just as the people in Ephesus had endured patiently. They could not bear evil, but notice what Jesus says, but they did bear up for Christ's namesake. They couldn't bear evil, there's a play on words here, but they did not bear up for Christ's namesake. In other words, when a trial came among them, they didn't give up. They didn't throw in the towel. They didn't become like the world. If you look at many of the churches in the East, in China, or in South America and Africa, they're greatly blessed because they endure persecution. Often in the West, when trials come or problems come our way, the first thing we do is throw in the towel. But Jesus commends the Ephesians for the fact that they patiently endured. And so the lesson for us, if we find ourselves in a situation where it's hard to be devoted to Christ, the message is don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. And I realize 
I'm in a different situation for many of you because I work in a, in a Christian environment. Many of you work in secular environments where it's hard. And you'll face trials and temptations and you might be told to stop doing certain things. But we're called to persevere. We're called not to forsake the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church at Ephesus was commended for that. But what does Christ have against the church at Ephesus? Verse 4, he says this, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Jesus here criticizes the loveless church in Ephesus. You would think that after all that he commends them for, all those things that he commends them for, that Jesus would just basically give them a reward and then he would move on to the next church. Well, let's face it, that's what we would do in many of our churches today. In many contemporary churches, you would point out the good things, you would overlook the things that look bad, and then you would move on. Jesus does commend them. But he notices there's something wrong. There's something wrong in the church in Ephesus. Jesus has something against them. Three things to commend them, one complaint. You know, Jesus had a few things against Pergamum, but only one thing against the church in Ephesus. Yet this one thing was so serious that Jesus threatened to remove their lampstand if they did not repent. This one thing... Of all things, Jesus said, if you don't repent of it, you will cease to exist as a church. And this is the reality for us if, if the danger of having everything but the main thing. If you have everything as a church but you're missing the main thing, then there's a problem. Jesus tells us that the Ephesians had abandoned the love they had at first now what is that love they had at first some people will say well it's their love for christ they had abandoned their love for christ other commentators will say well maybe it is maybe it isn't maybe it's their love for each other because in ephesians 1 and verse 15 paul commends the church at ephesus for their love for one another but you don't have to say it's this love for christ or that it's love for people you can say well it's both because what's the greatest commandment in Scripture? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and what? Your neighbor as yourself. If you love God, then you will love neighbor. You can't separate those two things out. And so this is what's gone on in the church at Ephesus. They'd stop loving Christ, and they'd stopped loving people. And notice, Jesus says, they abandoned their first love. They abandoned their first love. It wasn't accidental, but it was a willful act. It wasn't an accident that they'd abandoned the love they had at first. It was willful, because Jesus says they abandoned it. They abandoned it. It was not all at once. It wasn't just like that. Incremental. It was little by little by little. As they went on in the church, they abandoned their first love. They drifted away. But what is the first love? What is first love? Well, if you're married, <laughs> Jess is laughing at me now. If you're married, you might know this. It's honeymoon love, right? Everyone remember who's married, what honeymoon love is like when, when you meet each other and you can't stop talking about each other, gazing into each other's eyes and all that other sort of gushy stuff. You do everything together. This is what it was like for the Ephesians. They had that honeymoon love. But if you're not careful in a marriage, like in a church, romance can become routine. And you end up doing things for doing things' sake. You lose the romance and things just become a routine. This is what happened at the church of Ephesus. They'd lost, they had abandoned their love they have at first. Think about it like this. The church at Ephesus had become like a husband who says to his wife, I don't love you anymore. But don't worry, 
I'll stick around. I'll still be here. I'll father the children, but I just don't love you anymore. That's what the Ephesians were basically saying. They'd lost their love for Christ, but they still came to church. To abandon the love you had at first is to say, Lord, I don't love you anymore. I don't love your people. But I'll still come to church. I'll sit in the pew. I'll sing. I'll pray. I'll give, even give. But I don't love you. See, all the church had left at Ephesus was cold orthodoxy. And how many churches have, have we seen in this country close because they eventually just become cold? They might have great doctrine and do good things, but they're cold. And the question for us is, have we abandoned our first love? Do we still love Christ? See, in your Christian life, you are either going forward or you're going backward. You're not stuck in the middle. You don't have the option like you have in a car where you can put, if you still, if you have an automatic, this doesn't apply, but if you have a gear shift, you put into neutral. You don't have that in the Christian life. As a Christian, you're either going forward or you'll be going backward. You're either drawing closer to the Lord Jesus Christ or you're drifting further away from him. And that's what was happening at the church at Ephesus. They were drifting away from Christ. You cannot be indifferent to the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot be indifferent to Christ. And so in your Christian life, if you're not progressing, if you're not moving forward, if you're not seeking the Lord Jesus Christ, you're drifting away. And you're moving into cold orthodoxy. You're abandoning the love that you have at first but the good news is the Lord Jesus corrects this loveless church the letter doesn't stop in verse 4 verse 4 is not the end of the letter there is still hope for the church at Ephesus who have abandoned their first love because God is a gracious God he's slow to anger he's abounding in steadfast love and compassion on his people which is why we read in verse 5, Remember, therefore, where from you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And so in verse 5, Jesus gives the church three ways in which to restore their relationship. The first thing is to remember. He calls the church at Ephesus, who had fallen from heights of devotion to Christ and needed to be restored, he called them to remember because there are times when forgetting the past can be dangerous. Just think about the Old Testament. What's the basic message to the people of Israel in the Old Testament? If you read through all the books in the Old Testament, it's that you forgot that God redeemed you out of the land of Egypt. And you keep breaking his law. God was gracious to you. And yet you forget. Someone once said, if you, you forget history, you're condemned to repeat it. This is why it's so important that we remember. And there are some things we ought to remember as Christians. You ought to remember the day when Christ forgave you of your sins. I'm not necessarily speaking of that exact moment in time because that might not be the same for all of us but as Christians we ought to remember what it is to be forgiven of our sins this is why Luther said he preached the gospel to himself every day because we need to know the grace of God we need to be reminded of the grace of God in our lives every day or we can end up in cold orthodoxy we should preach the gospel to ourselves and remind us to remind us that we're forgiven sinners we shouldn't forget what God did for us in Christ of the redeeming love of God in Christ 
Because that's what the people in Ephesus had forgot. They'd forgotten the grace of God. And as Christians, and even I myself recognize this in my own life, you need to be reminded of the gospel. You need to be reminded that you're a forgiven sinner, that God has done something for us. But you end up drifting away. What's the second thing? The second thing is that need to repent. What's repentance? Repentance is basically of change of mind. That's what the gospel is calling people to, to repent of their sins, to change their thinking, to stop going that direction and to go this direction. And this is what God calls the Ephesians to do. They needed to change their hearts and attitudes and behavior. Turn around and come back to God. This is what Christ says to them. They are to repent. They are to remember, to repent. And then thirdly, he says, you are to do the works you did at first. You are to do the works you did at first. The call to do the works tells us that, the, that love is more than emotion. Love is more than an emotion. I can't remember what Vody Borkham said. I've got that quote in my head, but it's gone. It's more than emotion. It's what you do. Think about what John writes in 1 John 3.18. He says this, little children, he's writing to the church, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. So love isn't just an emotion. It's something that we do. We're called to love in deed and truth. So what first works were the, the people at Ephesus meant to do, again, that Jesus calls them back to? Well, they are to go back and do the things that Paul did with them those three years he was there in Ephesus, training them when he taught them as he lived amongst them. If you read what Paul did, they met on a daily basis to read and study scripture. They were called to live that out, apply it to their lives. In other words, they were to pray, they were to read the scriptures, they were to worship with each other, they were to fellowship, and they were to evangelize. These are the things that Paul did amongst them when he established that church. Those are the works Christ is referring to. That's what was commended to, to them in the first place, that they did those things. But if the church did not do this, then the Lord would come to them and remove them, i.e. they would cease to exist as a church. Now, it's true. We believe that if you're truly in Christ, you will not lose faith. Christ will not give up on you. You have been brought into the kingdom of God. And as Jesus says, you are in the Father's hands and you are in his hands. And no one can snatch you out of their hands. That's true of a believing Christian. But it's not true of a local church. Nowhere in the Bible does Jesus ever promise that a local church will keep on going. Now it's true in Matthew 16 verse 18, Jesus promises to build his church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. But that's the universal church. That's not the local church. Jesus never promised to keep local churches going. There's no guarantee that local churches will keep going if they continue in willful disobedience to Christ. And so Jesus says in verse 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Notice verse 7 has an excitation for us, and it has a promise. What's the ex excitation? We are to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Are you paying attention to what the Spirit says through his word? As Christians, we need to listen up. We need to pay attention. If you read the parables of Jesus, for example, in Mark 4, when Jesus begins his parable, the first word he tells people is, listen, listen up. 
In verse 3 and verse 9, he says, those who have ears, let them hear. Now, when you think about that, everyone Jesus is speaking to has what? They'll have ears. What Jesus is saying, those who are his, who are spiritually alive, should listen to what he is saying. And heed what he is saying. Put into practice what he is saying. That's the exhortation Jesus gives to his church to listen. Not just to let it pass by you and put it into practice. But he also gives a promise. It's a promise to conquer. In other words, that they would prevail after struggling. Jesus, oh, sorry, John says again in 1 John 5 verse 4 to 5. He uses the same word for conquer, but in my translation it says overcome. He says this, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? As Christians, we are conquerors. We are overcomers because of our faith, because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and our confession that he is the Son of God, we are overcomers. We are conquerors. And Jesus says, the conqueror will receive a reward to eat from the tree of life, that they would eat from the tree of life. And obviously there's a connection to the book of Genesis here, and we'll get to that in a second, but if you're familiar with Ephesus, if you had been there in the first century, if you went to that famous temple, 127 columns, massive temple, with all that idolatry going on, in the front of the temple was a garden, in the middle of the garden there was a tree, and the people at Ephesus thought that tree gave them eternal life. And John is saying, that's not the tree. It's not that tree. There's another tree. It's the tree of Genesis. Because remember, Adam was banished from the garden. And so could no longer eat from the tree of life. In a fallen condition. In a fallen condition. But the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, promises to the one who conquers that they will eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Where's the paradise of God? Well, what did Jesus say to the thief of, on the cross when he recognized Christ? He says, even though you're going to die right now, today you will be with me in paradise. The paradise of God is where Christ is, in heaven. But what happened? What happened to the church at Ephesus? Because we only have the words of the Lord Jesus and his call for that church to listen and to hear and to repent and to overcome. But what happened? Well, in the second century, there's a church father by the name of Ignatius uh, of Antioch, who was a disciple of the Apostle John, who wrote the letter of, the Revela uh, Re Re letter of Revelation. And he writes to the Ephesians in the second century. And he tells us that the church did heed the warning. They did heed the warning. They repented and once again became a thriving church. And so if we're to believe the words of Ignatius, they heeded the warning. They listened to the voice of Christ. Their ears were spiritually open and they repented. They remembered, they repented and they did the works they did at first. But, sadly, today, the best and greatest church in the New Testament is no more. There is no longer a Christian church at Ephesus. If you were to go to Turkey today, again, Asia Minor's Turkey, there's no church in Ephesus. Ephesus is just an archaeological site. 
You can go there and you'll see this one column remaining of the temple of Artemis, the great, that great temple. That was destroyed. There are no churches in Ephesus. In fact, Turkey is 99% Muslim. They worship Allah and do his deeds and do his works. There's a lesson in this for us. And it's a lesson because the very same thing can happen to us. When you think about our own nation, this nation had some of the greatest theologians, it had some of the greatest preachers, and it had some of the greatest churches. When you think about the Puritans, when you think about Wesley, Whitfield, Spurgeon, Lloyd-Jones, and the list can go on. And then you look at us today, and we've fallen. We've fallen from our heights. See, we need to understand the danger of leaving our first love. And finding our desires in something other than Christ and his church. There's a lesson for us. This is not just about the church in Ephesus. As we go through these churches, we need to contemplate in, on our own lives. Have we abandoned our first love? Are we doing the deeds we did at first? Are we like that church in Ephesus? Because we, like that church, need to listen what Christ says in his word to the people of God.